Welcome to another episode of Strange Days Live on Monday, February 12, 2024. Sorry for being late today. I just came home from work. So, yeah, there you go. Little half an hour. Uh, not a big deal, right? It's all right. <clears throat> so, just a half an hour late. But I do have a show planned out for you guys. So, welcome. And I'm sorry for the delay. I hope you guys had a good weekend and were able to enjoy a good Super Bowl, I should say. I wasn't invested into any other teams. Um, I was rooting, I'll admit. I was rooting for the Niners. Um, just because they are a California team. And I happen to be broadcasting from California. <clears throat> so that was good enough. Good enough for me. Um, but no, the other guys... The Chiefs were able to make a stunning comeback and win it all. But no skin off of my back. I enjoy the, the game itself. <clears throat> Hope you guys had a good time with your family. Enjoyed it. You know, all the good things that go with, uh, you know, with watching uh, sports. I'm a kind of a sports fanatic. And uh, it's amazing how sports can increase your heart rate and make you nervous all right something that we're not going to get any benefit from it just bragging rights right but people still get very invested in it anyways <clears throat> for today's show and for today's topic i chose to give a shout out if you will to the little less known cryptids or maybe the the b celebrity of the cryptid worlds. Now, it's not their fault that they haven't been exposed or that they haven't been uh, grossly examined, okay? But there are a lot of cryptids out there that, you know, people are like, I never heard of that one or I never heard of this guy or that guy. We all heard of the big A-listers, right? Like you have your Bigfoot and <clears throat> your Skinwalkers, your... Dogmans, your chupa cabras, but there's other guys out there that just may want the recognition just as much, but unfortunately they don't have it. So I said, why not on this beautiful Monday give them their proper shout out, just like I give you guys a shout out. Hey, Ghost Biker, how are you? Good. Thank you for joining us. I often think about your show, and I've sent some guests, uh, some people along your way. I've had some uh, good guests that I'll probably send out. Um, I'll, I'll text you and stuff because I have some people that you may want to enjoy um, interviewing yourself. So, yeah, I'm excited. Uh, today, Monday, is still a little bit cold here in the South uh, California area. We had a little bit of, uh, last week, a little bit of um, rain in, uh, you know, Rain in California don't mix uh, really well because uh, I don't think our city was built to uh, accept a lot of rainfall. So we kind of get overwhelmed very quickly and, you know, things go from there. But um, yeah, otherwise, I um, hope you guys had a good weekend. It was a short weekend, like weekends, uh, you know, always tend to be. But other than that, um, let's get into the show. I try to cut the introduction a little bit short because I know that when I listen to a podcast, I just kind of want to jump right into it. And that's my uh, purpose here. So the first um, cryptid sighting being that we're going to talk about, it's something known as the Sandown Clown. Have you guys ever heard of the sound, Sandown Clown? Clown, sorry. <laughs> This is uh, purportedly was an, an alien, okay, an alien sighting uh, that occurred in Europe, in the country of England. 
and it was uh, a one-time deal, okay? Uh, people believe it was probably a custom human, or maybe a supernatural creature, maybe a robot. Other theories said that it could have been a hoax, a shared hallucination, or an extraterrestrial robot. How about that? Shared hallucination is a very strange phenomenon. You know, I, they've been, um, they've attributed, if you guys are familiar with uh, the Fatima apparition that occurred in, Pol- Por- in Portugal, I think it was the early nine. Let, let's just say the early 1900s. <clears throat> there was a, a mass. Uh, these three kids had a vision of the Virgin Mary. They were entrusted with three secrets, and you know when the news got out, there was a lot of people that uh, also were able to, uh, to witness what is called the miracle of the sun. And uh, when the sun was doing these strange, weird things and movement, and they attribute uh, that, uh, they've attributed that to a shared hallucination. Anyways, getting down to the sundown clown, no pun intended. uh, This was a strange being that was actually encountered by two young children, okay, that were vacationing at Lake Common in Sandown, the Isle of Wight in the UK. This occurred in May of 1973. According to the kids, following what sounded like an ambulance uh, ambulance siren, uh, the children wandered across a footbridge over a stream and met a very curious, unidentifiable being that had was described by these two kids as a cross between a clown, a robot, and an alien. <clears throat> and it was shy, but friendly, according to the kids. He spoke very kindly to them for almost half an hour, before they were able to return to their parents and seemingly vanished after the encounter and has never occurred, witness of or happened again. So a friendly clown. So, you know, this was the 70s. So if your kid went missing for half an hour uh, in a small village in England, uh, you wouldn't call 911 and put a missing report in because it was different times. You know, I grew up in the early 80s and we would be out, you know, sometimes three, four hours in the streets playing along. And so it was um, it was sort of like the standard of growing up in that, that uh, date and time. And I wish it would be the same for those kids growing up now that all they have to do is stare at a screen all day long. Poor kids. Anyway, so this is kind of like a cool little cryptid, you know, or cool little creature, I should say. Sand down cloud. You know, if you're a kid... <clears throat> I mean, those are like the, I mean, kids nowadays are kind of, or they went through a phase, I guess, a couple of years ago when people were reporting scary clowns. And um, I was able to tolerate clowns personally as a, a, at an early age. I wasn't really scared of clowns. So you have a perfect mix. You know, you have a clown, you have a robot, and you have an alien all in one. And it happens to be a friendly being. And the kids actually were able to speak to this uh, thing for over half an hour. I just thought it was a really cool um, story. And it, it goes a little bit into, into more uh, explanation here. So despite standing over two meters in height, so that's roughly about 6'4", the Sandown clown <clears throat> heart more or less of uh, normal human proportions, according to the kids. It had two arms, two legs, a round head with very identifiable facial features. The similarities to a normal human actually ended right there. Uh, however, the, the being's head was described as being a little bit too large for a very thin frame. And it was shaped like a perfect sphere. The skin was very white and had the consistency of paper, while its hands and feet possessed only three digits each. And its face seemed to have been crudely painted onto the surface of his head. There was two blue triangles, seemingly located and representing where the eyes uh, of this face should be. There was a flat brown rectangle, which actually served for a nose. And its mouth had thin yellow lips shaped in an oval, okay, which they did not move at all when he spoke or he ate. Well, I guess he ate in front of the kids as well. 
Its hair hung down beneath its hat in a sparse, frizzle, reddish-brown strands, and two wooden antennas stuck out from the sides of his head, while more wooden, slant-like antenna extended from its wrists and its ankles. Cool-looking thing. I found an image online, and I'm going to put it on the show, so you guys can take a look. Now, mind you, is um, it's a black and white. I wish it had been color, so it would give you a little bit more insight into what the this beautiful clown, this beautiful weird clown looked like. So here's the image of what the kids were describing. So you see nice um, round face with the, it kind of looked like a, like maybe like a what a kid would like draw if somebody was if you tell a kid to draw us um, like a Halloween <clears throat> pumpkin or maybe like yeah like a little pumpkin I would say or like a straw man perhaps so you have the antenna there being represented and you had like a microphone type deal let's see what that was all about. Uh, it seemed to be wearing uh, some type of clown costume, which consisted of a tall pointed hat with a black knob or bobble at the top, and a high collared suit of red and green, to which the hat was at first attached, but was later removed <clears throat> Excuse me, by the being to show its white and apparently balding scalp. It wore dark blue gloves, and its feet were bare. <coughs> the suit's trousers and sleeves were long and frilly. Whether the wooden antenna were part of the costume or part of the body still remains unknown. Uh, this particular sand, uh, sand down cloud also was carrying a microphone or a tannoy system through which it spoke and which is believed to be the source of the ambulance-like siren heard by the children. They lived in a two-story <laughs> two hut or shack in a wooden area close to the lake whose walls were papered with blue-green dial patterns and whose floors were metallic. That's so cool. I mean, you know, if it was if it was some kind of alien entity and uh, he was sort of showing them the inside of, uh, of his craft, uh, that sounds like a cool kind of craft, you know? The hut also contained rough wooden furniture which we would describe as being similar to a table or a set of chairs. <clears throat> the clown... Uh, the clown being's demeanor seemed shy but friendly, as I spoke earlier. It told the kids that it was frightened of humans and would not defend itself if it were attacked. I mean, I'm kind of... I think you, you guys are falling in love with this creature right now, huh? It claimed to drink water from the stream after cleaning it and gather wild berries while it ate uh, in a very odd manner by thrushing its head forward and somehow moving the berries back and forth between its eyes and the down of its mouth. It could write in English using a pencil and paper. Upon being asked, it told the little girl that his name was Sam and that it was that it was all colors. I don't know what that means. When it asked if it were human, it said it, he was not a human being. And when they asked him if he was a ghost, he reported to the kids and told them, well, not really, but I am in an odd sort of way. So not really saying I'm a ghost, but maybe I'm a ghost. It's kind of cute. All other questions about what it might be were answered solemnly with, you know. <laughs> That's so cute. <clears throat> Possible explanations of the case. There are several explanations as to what the being could have been. The theories include a human being wearing a costume, Perhaps, but kind of an elaborate plan uh, just to fool some little kids. Uh, a fairy, kind of big for a fairy of what we kind of think fairies are. Ghosts uh, seem to have a corporal body and able to take down food. So I don't know if a ghost would kind of fit my idea of what a ghost should be. Another type of paranormal supernatural creature. Yeah, I mean, that's basically what it is. A robot. I don't know if a robot would need uh, need to eat. Uh, an extraterrestrial, perhaps, a hoax, maybe, or a shared hallucination also known as foil et de. I like that French term. A hoax, yeah, be, I mean, if it was a hoax, it was a heck of a, of a, of a, of a cute hoax, if you can call a, a hoax um, cute. 
but yeah, that's, uh, um, that's all about, you know, Mr. Sandown Clown. I like that. So that there's one, one down <clears throat> you guys have probably never heard of, because I, up until today, I've never heard of this guy right here. Um, but he sounds very amicable. Okay, now we're gonna st let's stick in Europe further. Now we're gonna stick in Europe. Let's see what will be the next. <clears throat> well, let me man. Actually, let's man the lines here and see how everybody's doing. Wonderful, everybody's doing good, perfect. I hope you guys are doing awesome. Hope you guys are enjoying this kind of weird ditty of a show here. It was kind of put together at the last minute, but I thought you guys would enjoy the topic. <laughs> Okay. So our next um, cryptid, there's one called the Diogen. Let's talk a little bit about the Diogen. The Diogen, spelled D-E-O-G-E-N, also known as the Diogen, or the Eyes in Dutch, is an evil spirit said to haunt the Sonian forest in Belgium. And this little guy is often seen in fog form and followed by smaller shadow figures. The story, which is based on a series of true events, has become more of a campfire tale or urban legend with virtually no sighting in recent years. <clears throat> I'm sorry, guys. I had some ice cream and screwed up my throat. So pardon me if I'm making all kinds of weird noises here. Okay, so how does... Uh, the Diogen manifests itself basically as a green fog. Sometimes it's orange, sometimes it's gray, and other times it's white in color. And it's often accompanied by small shadow figures. Uh, it's also been seen with laughing children, <clears throat> and it leaves bloody palm prints on car windows. According to the book Der Kinder van Handen Spaus, which was written in 1937, the letter, the legend of the Diogen is said to have begun when local nuns began finding the burned bodies of young children in the Sonian forest in Belgium near Brussels. That's a horrible thing. It is said in the book that 80 children were burned and the bodies placed in a forest. Um... But the more accepted number after it's been researched is actually eight. Still very sad. Very little is known of the case except that which is found in the book, which is believed by many to have been a work of entire fiction. The term the Ogden, Dutch for the ice, originated from reports that something large was said to have been staring at witnesses from within the fog. You know, um... <clears throat> There's a user here that says, My grandmother told me of Diogen when I was young, when we visited her in Brussels. She had the book and I read it. It wasn't a book really, it was more of a pamphlet with a short story within. The story read like some true crime ghost tales and was obviously just a story. My understanding of it was based on a true story. The bloody palm prints on the car window, too, was just an urban legend in the 1950s. Some people take these folktales too seriously, though. When is it all just the folktale? <laughs> That's funny. So this is the Diogen, which apparently is just um, a myth, unfortunately. No, fortunately, really, right? Because he leaves bloody palm prints in your car. I mean, who would want to have their car full of bloody Body, bloody pen prints. The next one is a case. It's called an, uh, his name, or he's known as the 1856 French pterodactyl. So, in 1856, the French pterodactyl was an entombed pterosaurus. These are the, you know, the large birds with the huge beaks, reptile looking wings. Um, they kind of tend to be in all the dinosaur shows or like if you watch a dinosaur movie, these are the guys who are always kind of like flying up about. So actually what the story says is that it was actually woken up when the miners were constructing a tunnel and they split some rocks. This story is a tall tale and definitely a hoax, but it retains an edible appeal to the 14 researchers. 
the original report of the thesaurus, uh, thesaurus, I'm just going to call them pterodactyl. I kind of grew up with them, knowing, knowing them as pterodactyl, so we'll stick to that. <clears throat> this creature, which belongs to the class of animals considered to be extinct, has a very long neck and a mouth filled with sharp teeth. It stands on four long legs, which are uh, united together by two membranes, doubtless intended to support the animal in the air, and is armed with four claws that terminate by a long and crooked talons. Its general form, form resembles that of a bat, differently only in its size, which is that of a large goose. Its membranous wings, when spread out, measure from tip to th tip to tip three meters, approximately like seven to eight feet. Its color is livid black. Its skin is naked, so I guess flesh color, thick and oily. <clears throat> So the incident, according to an illustrated London news report dated February the 9th, 1856, a pterodactyl had supposedly emerged, weak but nonetheless, nonetheless alive, from out of a hollow boulder that was blasted apart during the then recent excavation of a new railway tunnel in Comment, France. As soon as it took its first breath of air, however, it promptly expired. Oh, so that's pretty sad. That's all it says on this guy, Pterodactyl. And if you look on YouTube, there's been a lot of uh, people claiming to have seen a Pterodactyl. Usually they attribute it like in Bali or uh, in this tropical islands uh, off the coast of Indonesia, if you will, or Borneo. There's these flying reptiles that are still able to be alive there. Uh, there's also been um, some people that have created these like flying, you know how you have like the flying uh, airplanes, the RC airplanes, and they're able to build uh, flying pterodactyls. So yeah, that's another one of these mysterious <clears throat> quote-unquote cryptids. So far we have the Sandown Cloud, Clown. That's plausible. The Diogens was already dismissed as being fabrication. And I think the French pterodactyls go in that route too. Maybe that's why these guys haven't gained a lot of uh, notoriety. Because one of them was seen only once and the other guys have pretty much been hoax. Anyways. Let's move on to our lesser known um, cryptids. This is called the Catalonia Fallen Angel. The Catalonia Fallen Angel was a strange humanoid cryptid that was, on, that was filmed in a forest near Catalonia, Spain. The sighting, judged by the camera typer, type timer, took place at 1.13 a.m. on June 11, 2006. The creature is eminently humanoid. The creature is nearly skeletal, as if it's suffering from anorexia, while the body is almost exactly identical to that of a human. It appeared to possess glowing eyes. Its most defining features, however, are the growth emerging from its back that resemble featherless wings like those of a molting bird. Possible explanations. There are several explanations as to what this creature could be. Some of the theories are an undiscovered species, an insane hermit, okay, or a demonic presence. While chasing the creature, the two men in the video encounter large white feathers, as is from the wings of a large bird. Let's see here. I'm trying to look to see if... Yeah, I don't know if I'll be able to, to put the video, to play the video. Let's see here. Maybe. Let's see if I can. Okay, let me see if I can play the video for you guys. Give me one second here and... Sorry, I forgot how you did we do this. There is a way to play videos on this. I use I'm using um StreamYard. And I 
know there's a way to do it. Sorry, guys, I don't remember. Anyways, so just look it up, the Fallen Angel in Catalonia, and you'll be able to see the video. It's, you know, it's like your, it's like your typical video. It's very um, hard to see, it's very hard to appreciate, and then you have uh, shakiness. So take that uh, with a grain of salt. The next uh, European legend, it's the Highgate Vampire. Let's talk about the Highgate Vampire. This is a legendary supernatural creature that is said to haunt the Highgate Cemetery in London, England. The story of the Highgate Vampire gained significant attention in the 1970s and has since become one of the most famous cases of paranormal activity in England. The Highgate Vampire is a malevolent entity that takes the form of a tall, dark figure with hypnotic red eyes. It is believed to have been summoned through occult rituals performed by a group of individuals practicing black magic in the cemetery during the late 60s and early 70s. These rituals allegedly involved sacrificing animals and performing some weird ceremonies. I'll just leave it at that. <coughs> Excuse me. Reports of encounters with the Highgate Vampire began to surface in the late 1860s, excuse me, 1960s, with witnesses claiming to have seen the creature lurking among the tombstones and mausoleums of Highgate Cemetery. Some described being overwhelmed by the sense of dread and terror when encountering the vampire, while others claimed to have been physically attacked or drained of their energy. So what we have so far, we have a tall, dark figure with hypnotic red eyes, believed to have been summoned through occult rituals performed by a group of individuals practicing black magic in the cemetery during the 60s or 70s. Possible explanations, an individual's black magic, a vampire, notable encounters which a person arranged flowers that were taken from a grave in a circular pattern with arrows of bloom pointing to a new grave which was uncovered a coffin was opened and the body inside was disturbed but their most macabre act was driving an iron stake in form of a cross through the lid and into the breast of the corpse pretty scary a highgate vampire belief in vampires was not uncommon during this period, especially in rural communities where folklore and superstition held significant sway over people's beliefs and actions. There was also one called the Mercy Brown Vampire Incident, which gained widespread attention both locally and nationally due to its sensational nature. So let's see what the Mercy Brown Vampire was all about. <clears throat> Okay, so the Mercy Brown Vampire is a straight vampire, notable part of Exeter, Rhode Island folklore, and an intriguing aspect of American history. It revolves around the exhumation of the body of Mercy Brown, a young woman who died of TB tuberculosis in 1892. The events surrounding her death and subsequent exhumation, that's when you buried a corpse and you bring it out of, you know, when you exhume something is when you bring the corpse, you disinter them. So you get their, go back, get all the dirt out, open the grave and bring the body out. Deeply rooted in the superstition and fears prevalent to the 19th century. So there was such a commotion that the poor little, poor girl, they actually exhumed her body to make sure that uh, she was not a vampire. Mercy Lena Brown was actually born in 1873 in Exeter, Rhode Island, and was the daughter of George and Mary Brown. In the late 19th century, New England was grappling with a tuberculosis epidemic, which led to the widespread fear and misunderstanding about the disease. Tuberculosis, often referred to as consumption at the time, was not very well understood and its symptoms such as coughing up blood, weight loss, and a very pale complexion were often associated with vampirism due to the lack of medical knowledge at the time. Tragically, Mercy's mom, Mary Eliza Brown, was the first in the family to succumb to tuberculosis in 1883, 
Following her mom's death, Mercy's older sister, Mary Olive, also fell ill and passed away in 1894. Mercy herself began showing symptoms of tuberculosis in, 19, in 1891 and eventually died on January 17, 1892. Her death further devastated the family, in particular her father, George, and her brother, Edwin. After Mercy's passing, several other members of the community also fell ill with tuberculosis. This series of deaths within a short span of time led to a heightened fear and suspicion among the local residents. In an attempt to find an explanation for the rapid spread of the disease, some turned to superstition and folklore. Amid the atmosphere of fear and desperation, local physician Dr. Harold Metcalf suggested a controversial solution. Exhuming the bodies of Mercy's deceased family members to check for signs of vampirism. In March of 1892, several months after Mercy's death, her body was exhumed from the cemetery. Upon opening Mercy's grave, it was reported that her body had not undergone significant decomposition, despite being buried for two months during winter. This phenomenon was interpreted as evidence that she had undead, that she was an undead or a vampire. Wow. Additionally, there were claims that fresh blood was found in her heart and liver during the examination. These findings only served to fuel the existing fears and superstitions surrounding vampirism. The beliefs in vampires were not uncommon during this period, especially in rural communities where folklore and superstition held significant sway over people's beliefs and action. The Mercy Brown vampire incident gained widespread attention both locally and nationally due to its sensational nature. Huh. That's interesting. I never heard of that one before. <clears throat> well, hence less known, right? So I hope you guys are enjoying this. This is very cool stuff. These are all like the little known cryptids. That's the title of the show, but I'm just going to... Yeah, I'm just going to... I might change the title to reflect more of what this is. This is uh, like, un, uh, you know, unappreciated. Uh, unappreciated uh, monsters, if you will. Okay. So for those of us joining late, we had the Sandown Cloud. Clown. What I keep saying? Cloud. Sandown Clown, which was plausible. The Diogen, which we know it's uh, make-believe. The French pterodactyl story, which is make-believe. We had the Catalonia Fallen Angel, which for there's a video online, that could be plausible. And then we had the Hindgate Vampire, okay, that's plausible. And that led us into the Mercy Brown Vampire, which is a sad story. Um, but it's, it's a true story. As far as she was a vampire, I seriously doubt it. But the next uh, person on our list is what's called the Silver Man. It sounds like a superhero, the Silver Man. There is actually the Silver Surfer, but this gentleman is the Silver Man. Let's see. The Silver Man sighting was an extraterrestrial sighting that took place at approximately 11.30 p.m., on the evening of the 17th of March, 1978. A 39-year-old service engineer by the name of Ken Edwards was making the 15-mile journey home to Warrington, Newtown, in which uh, he was uh, following uh, to go to a union meeting in the great Manchester area. So basically this guy was driving from home to a meeting in Manchester. Mr. Edwards claimed that he first spied what he thought was a man climbing, but he quickly realized that he was looking at a gargantuan, humanoid figure lumbering down a steep embankment adjacent to a nuclear facility. The startled engineer immediately hit the brakes on his van and it slowed to a halt near the curve of the road some 50 feet away from the hulking humanoid, which was now illuminated by his headlights. Okay. The anxious engineer estimated that the figure was at least seven feet in height 
and was either clad in some sort of reflective silver fabric akin to a radiation suit or had a dull metallic epidermis, means his skin. He also claimed that the figure's roundish face was black or that it was covered with some sort of mask with no discernible features except for a pair of glowing eyes. Furthermore, it had two thin arms that were not attached to its shoulders, but stuck straight out of its chest like a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Edwards also noticed that this creature assumed an odd stooped posture as if it scrambled down the hill, which seemed impossible for a human to emulate without toppling over. Huh. <clears throat> Somebody commented here, I said, oh, hell yeah. I guess the, <laughs> they like the thought of a guy with arms coming out of his chest running down the hill with glowing eyes, right? You have to have the glowing eyes. All right, the, the next, the next uh, person on our list is known as Whipping Tom. Whipping Tom. I like Whippy. That sounds good. Whipping Tom. Not Whoopi. Whipping Tom. It's a European being and criminal who attacked woman with a whip in 1681 and 1712. The attacks occurred both in London and the bordering village called Hackney. Both had locations uh, where the attacks happened. Accounts said that he cornered women in closed spaces on the street and spanked their behinds with a whip before fleeing. Because of the dates of the attack being a bit apart from each other, it is highly likely that there were two separate cases of a suspect named Whipping Tom. Wow. Possible explanations? A predator, you think? A work of fiction or tall tale? A possible moral panic legend? <laughs> Somebody... <laughs> It's funny. Somebody made a comment on the article and they call him Spanko. That would have been a better name instead of Whipping Tom, Mr. Spanko. And then somebody else commented behind saying, gosh darn it, Tom's doing the whip again, Mom. <laughs> comments, are, co comments are solid. Next one is called the Voronesh Alien. This sounds could be... Hungarian, maybe Voronesh. Could be wrong. The Voronesh alien sightings was a bizarre extraterrestrial sighting that took place in the evening of September 27, 1989, at about 6 30 p.m. in the Soviet Union. Okay, I was wrong. According to eyewitness accounts, a hatch on the underside of the still hovering craft opened to reveal uh, a long, uh, excuse me, an odd long arm necklace, thick set, nine foot tall entity with a small knob-like head. The creature was clad in silver jumpsuit, just like one of the other ones we just spoke about, with bronze boots and was so large it appeared to fill the hatch opening. As if the creature's immensity wasn't disturbing enough, eyewitnesses claimed that there were three luminous eyes wedged into its tiny dome-like head. The being's two outer eyes were whitish, and the center eye, which was set slightly above the other two, was bright red and swiveling around like a radar. They also claimed that the alien had a disc-like object attached to its chest. This bizarre being seemed to be methodically scanning the terrain below, then seal the hatch. Then the UFO made its descent. Eyewitnesses started that the object's weight Oh, excuse me, was so substantial that it permanently bent to the side of a, of a standing poplar tree that was near the hatch. The object then hovered about five feet off the ground and extended its four legs like support to land softly on the grass. At this point, <coughs> excuse me, the alien that was seen through the open hatch now emerged from the ship, followed by two equally colossal creatures that share the same three-eye visage. <coughs> Sorry, guys. These extraordinary entities walk with a heavy gait and were followed by what witnesses describe a box-like robot. 
Oh, I'm having a hard time here with push buttons on his front side. An alien adjusted one of the controls on the robot's chest, enabling to walk about in a mechanical fashion. <clears throat> huh. The Russian city of Voronezh is an industrial hub located about 300 miles from Moscow, and the city has a population of nearly 1 million. <clears throat> so that was the Voronezh alias. So you have one, two, three, six, seven. We have we just discussed our eight weird uh, urban legends, cryptids from Europe. We had the sand down clown, the Diogen, the French pterodactyl, the Catalonia fallen angel, the Highgate vampire, the other vampire, the silver man, whipping tom, also known as Spanko, and the Voronich alien. <clears throat> That's some cool stuff, huh? I guess everywhere you go in the world, you're, you're entitled to have your own. Um, you're entitled to have your own little. Uh, how would you say it? Cryptids, I guess. Right. One second, guys. My throat's been acting up a little bit, I guess, because I had some ice cream. Hey, Clutch, what's going on, buddy? Bless you. God bless you, Clutch. Thank you for listening, guys. I appreciate you. So, I guess we'll keep going with a few more, just so we can kind of go for the for the hour for the hour. But there's a bunch of these fun little urban legends or or things to discuss. <clears throat> Let's see. I'm trying to look for more here <clears throat> that we could we can talk about. And this, well, let me see. There's some of them that we can do. I can do like a whole expository show on. <clears throat> okay, let's talk about the sea monk, also known as the sea bishop or the bishop fish. This was the name that was given to a seal animal found off the eastern coast of the Danish island of Zealand in 1546. It was mentioned and pictured in the fourth volume of Conrad Gessner's famous Historia Animalium. Gessner also referred a similar monster found in the Firth of Forth, according to the Bodius, and sighting off the coast of Poland in 1531. England has these weird, play, I mean, places, the, the, the way that they name, um, it's cool, but it's hard to pronounce. Uh, it was described as a, as a human-sized fish that looked superficially like a monk. Uh, <clears throat> that's all it says. Pretty poor uh, report there. Sorry, guys. All right, I think, where else should we go next? The Kuzak aliens. <clears throat> Let's see the Kuzak aliens. Okay, so the Kuzak aliens, C-U-S-S-A-K aliens sightings was an extraterrestrial sighting that took place on, the August, on August 29th, 1967 in Kuzak, France. The witnesses were two children, Francois Delpeche and his sister, Anne-Marie, as well as their dog, Medor. I don't know if you can um, ask the validity of a dog being a witness, but nonetheless, Medor was there. The children reported seeing a sphere-shaped UFO, two meters in diameter, about six, four feet in diameter, and four little devils, quote-unquote, on the ground. The craft was a bright silvery color and possessed landing gear consisting of three or four straight legs equipped with round, um, what they called shoes, 10 centimeters in diameter. That's funny. They're able to approximate 
<clears throat> the diameter of the shoes, but they don't know if it had three or four legs. One of the humanoid beings was bending over, apparently busy with something on the ground, and another held a mirror-like object. The creatures were completely black, but with a shiny look uh, which Francois compared to that of silk. The children could not be certain whether the color was that of uh, being skin or some sort of protective suit, for there was no physical dividing line between any possible clothing and the heads of the beings which were bare. If there was a protective suit of some kind, it was perfectly fitted. The arms were somewhat too long and thin, and the children could not distinguish anything which may serve as hands. The legs were very short and thin, and the head seemed of normal proportion relative to the body, but the cranium, nose, and chin were equally pointed. So if you had, how many they reported? Uh, four. So if you have four creatures and they would they were able to fit in a sphere that was approximately six feet four, they have to be pretty little unless that sphere was maybe like a portal. But nonetheless, that's a Kuzak's aliens. <clears throat> huh. Okay. There's other cool stories, but I want to kind of remain uh, within the humanoid cryptid uh, theme. The Toms, the Tame, the Toms River Monster. Let's talk about that one. Oh, yeah, this was recent, actually. I remember seeing this video. Uh, there was a weird video of the Thames. That's a river that runs through London uh, a few years ago. It was maybe a year or two years. And it shows uh, kind of like Nessie. If you're familiar with the Loch Ness Monster, <clears throat> there's, um, I'm sure you can find a lot of these videos online. So the Thames River Monster was a strange cryptid caught on film by someone riding on the cable car in Greenwich, London, back in May, March 26th. Doesn't say the year, but I'm pretty sure it was either last year or the year before. The footage shows a large black shape reading out of the river before disappearing again, leaving a momentary disturbance in the water. Possible explanations are hoax, a phantom submarine, a whale, or an undiscovered species. Yeah, if you guys wanna, if you wanna, if you look into Google, uh, YouTube, says mysterious giant creature object in the Thames. One of the users said it could be a whale, dolphin, or porpoises. They have swum up the Thames a few times recently, probably disoriented by noise pollution. And it says here, in the clearest image of the video, the creature looks like several fins breaching. Huh. Yeah, that probably, probably could be some kind of dolphins that kind of went amok. <clears throat> okay, sorry, one second here. And these are like super, super short stories. I mean, they don't go into great um, detail because, like I said, they haven't been seen uh, by a lot of people. So <clears throat> some of them have only, have only had one, you know, one um, one visit or one, exp um, one identific identification. Via Santina aliens. Sometimes I have to, if they're too grow, uh, too, if they use the wrong wording for Google, I have to skip them because then I can get knocked out for saying, you know, certain words. The Via Santina aliens uh, sightings was an extraterrestrial sighting that took place on August 14th, 1947, near the Shirko Creek at Villa Santina in Italy. While painting, he noticed uh, a 30-foot disc object that had a line some uh, some distance away from this painter. He was the one that reported it. The name remains unknown. Uh, with his paintbrushes, the gentleman who had seen this disc, the artist hailed the creatures. It is possible that this was interpreted as a hostile gesture for one of the beings touched the center of its belt and projecting a thin vapor which caused the artist to fall dazed onto his back. So yeah, that's, it was very poorly written here. So I guess some guy was painting in the outdoors. He saw a disc. He made some kind of 
things with his brush, some kind of movements. The aliens got upset. They came out of the disc and they shot something into the artist's uh, face and made him fall. The creatures then approach uh, within two yards uh, of the artist and examine him and examine his easel. <laughs> Although weak, the artist contrived to roll over and saw the being picked up the easel, which had been knocked down. And uh, he perceived that he was actually taller than both of them. He also noticed that they were painting heavily. All right, so they were they were artists. What a weird story. Then they returned to the disc-shaped objects and entered it, whereupon it rose from the ground, hovered uh, above the painter, and disappeared. I wish if he still has the the art painted by an original alien. The artist said that they were about three feet tall and were wearing dark blue coveralls with bright red colors and belt. They also wore spherical helmets on the heads that seemed larger than normal, but their faces were not covered. Their faces had a greenish color. Their eyes were large and plumb with a vertical line in the center. They had no eyelashes or eyebrows. Each had a straight and rather large nose. Their hands were claw-like, green in color, with eight fingers on each. Four opposed to four in the same way, as our thumb is to our fingers. The story was recounted in May 1964 edition of Clyphus. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of a, a weird story. <clears throat> Anyways, hey, Brad. How are you, buddy? Good to have you here. I'm just kind of reading, like, some stories about, like, lesser-known cryptids, if you will, or lesser-known um, hoaxes or lesser-known urban legends. Came in a little late today, so I'm kind of wrapping things up. <clears throat> I've read a few so far, so let's see here. This is called the Gnome of Girona. There's actually a photo of this. If you guys want to look it up, Girona, spelled G-I-R-O-N-A, also known as the Nomo de Girona, is the name given to the remains of an animal or a fetus that was found near Girona, Catalonia, Spain, in September of 1989, that aroused some attention from the Spanish media, especially some TV programs specialized in parapsychology and the paranormal, such as limits of another dimension. The, be the being was captured by some campers about three miles from Girona as they were en route from the villages of Bayonet. They were traveling. They were near a forest when one of them heard some noises similar to low volume loans. Low volume moans, I'm sorry. When he looked in the direction from where the noises were coming, he spotted the being, the being that tried to escape, moving fast from them. The being emitted a kind of squeak similar to an old man's laughter. The campers managed to capture the being by throwing a blanket over it. The being they then remained alive for approximately 24 hours after its capture, although other versions of the story extend this time to four days. It refused all food offered to it, although according to its captors, it shows some degree of intelligence. After its death, the Spanish parapsychologist Angel, Angel Gordon got the body and preserved it in a jar with formal. And you can see a picture of this gentleman here. The creature's body was bluish, the void of air, with some little spots mainly in the neck and face. Its total length was approximately 4.7 inches. It showed a protuberance in the forehead area, elongated ears, reddish eyes, and a snout similar to that of rodents. Its finger shows interdigital membranes. There are several explanations as to what the creature could be. An extraterrestrial, a remnant fetus, a hoax, or an undiscovered species. Very interesting. Okay. 
Well, my friends, this is, uh, has been a pleasure. Another episode of Strange Days Live. <clears throat> I hope to have more um, interviews this week. And we'll keep doing this. We have uh, scary stories perhaps tomorrow. Maybe we can talk about more of these urban legends. Again, um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining me. Uh, subscribe and promote the show to your friends. And God bless you and have a great day great, wonderful night.